Well, we have uh, Dr. Winter this morning. Um, shall we have Dr. Winter, would you come forward, please? And repeat after me. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Dr. Winter, uh, I understand that you don't always find it very easy to hear. I'm very deaf, if that's what you mean. <laughs> that's a better way of putting it. I was being uh, polite. Um, we'll do what we can to help. I'm raising it now so that everyone uh, understands uh, that council will speak slowly and that if you have any difficulty uh, in hearing... Uh, please, please indicate, um, and uh, one way or the other, we, we hope that you will hear everything. If you don't, please let us know. I've managed through my hearing aids to get onto your loop system, so you're very clear at the moment. Well, I hope it continues that way, and I hope that the same is true of council, so thank you for that. Dr Winter, I'm just going to ask you, first of all, to give us an overview of, of your career. My understanding is that you studied um, at medical school at Guy's Hospital between 1968 and 1973. Correct. Um, you then undertook, over the following three years, various roles in general medicine. Yes. And then between 1976 and 1979, you were a lecturer and honorary senior registrar at the Middlesex Hospital. And is that where you undertook your haematology training? That's where I started. And then after four years, I transferred sideways to a similar post at Guy's Hospital, where I, my training was completed in 1983. Uh, and uh, whilst you were at the Middlesex Hospital, uh, I uh, gathered that you were seconded for six months to the Edgware Regional Blood Transfusion Centre. Yes, it was part of standard haematology training that all trainees had to spend six months at a regional blood transfusion centre to give them experience of the way in which transfusion centres work. Um, what were your duties in, in outline at the transfusion centre? Nothing of any great significance, to be honest. It was really observatory. I mean, you sat in, you, have, you went round the whole experience of one day you went out on the vans and helped blood to be collected. You spent some time in the laboratory. You spent some time uh, seeing how the fractionation, such as it was, happened before it went off to Elstree and um, you know, all the day-to-day -day workings of a blood transfusion service. Uh, so you, you transferred, as you just referred, um, uh, in 1979 to Guy's Hospital as lecturer and honorary senior registrar. Yes. And that was in the haematology department at Guy's. It was. And then you remained there until late 1983, and on the 1st of December, you took up a consultant post at Fanit General Hospital in Margate. Yes, it was, the post was, can, the, the health authority in those days was Canterbury and Fanit. And there was a haemophilia centre there, which for historical reasons, covered nearly all of the county of Kent and was the sort of biggest in the southeast outside of London. So it was a, a curious arrangement because of its geographical position. Uh, and then that centre relocated to Canterbury in the mid-1990s and became a comprehensive haemophilia care centre. Yes, for the, really because the centre had grown so much and because the geographical access was so poor and the facilities were not very good, that uh, the service was put out to tender by the local health authority and was eventually relocated into very good facilities on the 
the Canterbury site, so that, uh, that was a big step forward. And then shortly after that, we managed to get accreditation as a comprehensive care centre. Now, you retired from that post in 2011. Yes. Um, and then in terms of your membership of or involvement with other relevant organisations, you were a member of the United Kingdom Haemophilia Centre Directors Organisation from late 1983 until 2011? Yes, as are all haemophilia centre doctors. Uh, and uh, I think during that time, you, you were at various stages on, on UK HCDO working parties of one kind or another. I was. Um, you became a designated HIV physician for the area, um, was it the whole of Kent or the Margate area? It was for the health authority. This was really an unusual step. As we'll doubtless discuss, we had a particularly significant HIV problem. And the AIDS Control Act, which I think was 1985, stipulated every HIV, every health authority had to have a nominated HIV physician. So they said to me, how would I like to be the, that person as I seem to be the only one who had any HIV expertise. So from that moment on, I only did haemophilia and HIV. But that I think gave me uh, different insights because I think I was the only haemophilia doctor who was a HIV physician. So I had people with haemophilia and HIV and some people with HIV who did not have haemophilia. And, and we'll, you're right, we'll come on to that in, in more detail later. You were a medical trustee appointed by the Department of Health for the McFarlane and Eileen Trusts from 1996 to 2009. Yes, I think that came out of the HIV, you know, the rather unique HIV situation. I was a, a choice to be the trustee, which the uh, dates you say. Yeah. And again, we'll, um, I'll ask you some more about that at a later stage. Um, you had some involvement with the Haemophilia Society as I understand it, you were on their Treatment and Care Committee, and I'm taking these dates from your CV, from 1987 to 1991. Um, you were on their General Services Committee from 1992 to 1996, and their Medical Advisory Panel from 1999 to 2005. I, I was. I was particularly involved with them when we were trying to pressurise the government to set up what became the McFarland Trust. So I acted with them as a sort of media liaison and medical support and we went round, we went to the House of Commons a few times and made presentations and lobbied politicians. So yes, I, I was actively involved with the society. Uh, and then you were, um, uh, were one of the founders of a, an organisation called the Haemophilia Alliance, and I'll, I'll ask you a little more about that later. But that was established in, in 1999. It was. Now, you also um, have given evidence to both the Archer Inquiry and the Penrose Inquiry. I did. Um, I'm going to take your evidence to those inquiries as read, Dr Winter. I'm not going to go through it, although inevitably my questions will cover some of the same ground. Uh, and we may look at a handful of, your, uh, of extracts from your evidence. I want to start, if I may, by asking you about the, the four years or so that you were at Guy's Hospital, so from 1979 to 1984. Guy's was a, um, an accredited haemophilia centre, but a small one, is that right? Well, it was, because it was only barely a mile from St Thomas's, which was a major centre. So in a way, it was quite curious that it was seeing people with haemophilia at all. But there were some haemophiliacs who historically had gone there and chose to stay there and neither of the consultants had a interest or expertise in haemophilia so together with another senior registrar I started to get involved from that would be the first time really that I got involved with haemophilia patients. And um, roughly how many patients uh, were registered uh, with guys, haemophilia patients during that period? Well uh, there probably were sort of 30 or 40 registered, but there was a hard core of sort of 10 to 15 severely affected patients of all ages. Uh, and I think your statement suggests mostly adults, but there were a small number of children. There were. The director of the Haemophilia Centre was Dr Percy Barkin. 
He was an expert in vitamin K metabolism. Yes. Um, uh, and you've said in your statement, in practice, the haemophilia patients were managed by the senior registrars. Um, I think one of the other registrars would have been Dr. Clark, is that right? No, he was the other consultant. Oh. He was also not an expert in haemophilia. Um, can you recall who the other registrars were? I can. They were a husband and wife team, Dr. Hugh and Yvonne Williams. Um, now, your statement explains that as a registrar at, at Guy's, you weren't involved in the procurement of blood products. Can you help us with whose decision it was as to what products to, to source and use at Guy's? Was it Dr. Barkins? Well, I was certainly not part in any way of the procurement, as you say, because I had no r role in sort of day-to-day -day managerial functions as a, effectively uh, a trainee. My recollection was that we received from a transfusion centre supplies of such NHS-derived factor rate concentrate as was available. And that almost certainly was never enough. So to top that up, I'm sure this applied to nearly all centres, we had to purchase some commercial concentrate to meet needs. There was a particular issue in the South. Every health authority was supposed to have its own blood transfusion service. But for reasons that were never clear, the South East Thames did not have its own blood transfusion service. So the Tooting Centre, the Tooting Blood Transfusion Unit, covered two very, very large regional health authorities. It covered the South East and it covered the whole of the South West. And that really led to a lot of problems because that, that service was inevitably under a great deal of pressure in terms of clinical demand. I don't recall, I think that some, you know, we, we went to the pharmacy and said, you know, we're not receiving enough factor rate concentrate that is NHS derived, we're going to need to buy some commercial concentrate. I can't remember which one we used, and as I say, I was not part of the contractual arrangement. And the way you put it in your statement is your recollection that you received an allocation of, of, of NHS concentrate and then a shortfall was covered by the usage of commercial concentrates. Yeah. I'm going to ask you more about cryoprecipitate in a while, but ju just dealing with the use of it as a matter of fact, your statement says that at Guy's, cryoprecipitate was not used, although it was available. It was used on occasions if we had, for instance, a patient with mild haemophilia or von Willebrand's disease. Already, you know, late 1970s, we'll be talking more about this doubtless, but we're already aware of the evolving data about abnormal liver function suggestive of hepatitis. We were trying to l limit the exposure of patients to factor eight concentrates if they were not regularly treated patients. So I think occasionally if they were children, if it was a rarely treated child, particularly if they were adults, maybe on occasions if the products were in short supply, we certainly did use occasional cryoprecipitate uh, cryoprecipitate is so laborious to give up, you don't forget giving it. And, you know, I can remember days when we sat there drawing it up and giving it to patients, but there weren't, weren't very many of those days. And, and um, maybe you don't know the answer to this, but do you know whose decision it was at Guy's to make only limited use of cryoprecipitate. Was that Dr. Barkins or do you No, know? everything, all those clinical decisions were left to the two registrars running the, the program. So it, that, that was effectively your decision and the decision of the, yes. the co colleagues you've mentioned? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll come on later to, to the pros and cons of cryoprecipitate, Dr. Winter. Um, you also said in your statement that when you started at Guy's, there was no home treatment program, but you established one. Um, c can you um, perhaps just explain a little more how you went about it, what discussions took place? Well, it's only, as we've said, a pretty small number of patients, but, you know, if factor eight concentrates came in, what, 73, 74, and they instantly and immediately revolutionised the quality of life for people with haemophilia, um, 
and by the mid-1970s most centres had established this package of comprehensive care uh, which included a home treatment programme. So this wasn't anything controversial. It was surprising that guys, you know, for patients with severe haemophilia didn't have such a programme established. So I spoke to Dr. Barkan and he thought, you know, I mean, his attitude was he wasn't going to get involved with the management of haemophilia care, even though they were a designated haemophilia centre. And he was very happy for us to take the matter forward. It didn't involve very much in the way of financial input. It was really logistics. It was training patients how to give their own injections, training parents how to give injections, getting transport arranged so we could get factor eight to the home setting. There wasn't, there wasn't a great deal of expense involved. It was really quite a straightforward undertaking. Um, was any consideration given as to whether setting up a home treatment program would increase the demand for concentrates and, and therefore potentially increase the need for commercial concentrates to be used? Well, I think there's data that the use of factor rate was already increasing at that time and in particular people were beginning to start to use prophylaxis that's to say factor rate given not to treat a bleed but to prevent a bleed and people with haemophilia once they were established on home therapy which was such an enormous advantage they could take factor rate to their school or to their work and inject it in the place where they were they, you know, their life didn't revolve around haemophilia centres any longer. It just gave them, you know, complete independence. And they then began to look at their lives and say, every Tuesday evening I play tennis. And I seems to me sensible, because it's a risk activity, but one that I very much enjoy. I'm going to talk to the doctors about whether I might give myself an injection to target that period of activity. So prophylaxis was, you know, pioneered by the Swedish really they were starting to be there as part of haemophilia management and something that, but most particularly for children, later for adults, was something that was really effective. So factor rate was growing in usage from the mid-1970s onwards. And what information or advice um, did you or your, um, your fellow registrar colleagues give to patients or parents of patients in relation to, to home treatment and, and the use of factor eight? Well, I mean, there were criteria that you had to jump through to be able to get onto the program. Uh, you had to be able to do your own injections if you were an adult, if it was a child, we needed to be satisfied that the parents had the ability to recognize a bleed and then to implement the factor eight therapy promptly to keep records. So there were a number of hoops the patients had to jump through from our point of view. And then we obviously informed them as to, you know, the nature of concentrate to look out for any side effects, even though the side effects were much less than with cryoprecipitate, which really did quite commonly cause significant side effects. I can't remember whether we gave them at that stage any written publications. It's more than 40 years ago. I can't remember... I can't remember whether we said anything to them about the evolving evidence about non-A, non-B. We certainly would have spoken about hepatitis viruses because part of being on a comprehensive care program, including home therapy, is to come in every two or three months and have a full clinical review. And that included blood tests, which included hepatitis markers. So the patients certainly were aware that they were being screened every three months or so. We didn't have hepatitis B vaccine at that stage, but they were aware that part of the package of care they were getting was a range of blood tests which have to be carried out on people with haemophilia, most especially for trying to see whether they had, um, developed what we call an inhibitor. About 10% of people with haemophilia develop an antibody which recognizes the factor eight and destroys it. And that's a very significant clinical development because it makes future treatment with factor eight really difficult. So people with haemophilia need regular blood checks anyway, as well as wellness checks. And part of that package of blood tests was to do hepatitis markers. 
I was certainly aware of the evolving data around non-A, non-B. I can remember us talking about it. I can't recall at this distance of time whether we spoke to the patients about our concerns. I'll, I'll ask you a little more about, about that at a later stage. But again, just dealing with um, what, as a matter of fact, was, was established at Guy's, um, what you've said in your statement is in terms of the treatments that were used for patients with severe haemophiliac adults, you would use either the BPL, LSG product, or commercial, depending upon supplies. D do you have any sense or recollection as to how often it was that you, you had to use commercial products because there wasn't enough LSG material available? No, but it, it was such a recurrent thing for the next seven or eight years, really, extending into my consultancy. Factor 8 was always in short supply nationally, as we all know, but it was in especially short supply in these two health authorities because it was being served by one transfusion centre who were working flat out and who just couldn't cope with demand. So it was a very regular feature that you would have to top up with commercial. Do, do you um, know or, or, or recollect whether anything was said, uh, for example, by you or your colleagues or, or Dr. Barkin or others, uh, about this, this shortage and this particular problem uh, of, of having to depend on tooting, which was covering the, these two large... Uh, Thames Regional Health Authority areas. Was, was the, that problem raised with the blood transfusion service, do you know? Well, not to my knowledge. As I say, I wasn't a consultant. Okay. I was a, a, a doctor in training, so had no sort of managerial administrative roles. Uh, and although it was a designated centre, you'll see one of the papers you sent me uh, of a UK HCDO meeting, uh, I represented Dr. Barkan, and I can remember... Dr. Barkan didn't ever go to haemophilia meetings. He used to ask me to represent him, which I was happy to do. But I had, I had no sort of managerial responsibilities in doing that. And then in relation to moderate haemophiliacs, so again, this is still at Guy's, your statement says that, that you would use DDABP or, wherever possible, BPL concentrate. Yes, moderate haemophiliacs, some... Some do respond to DDAVP, some don't. So you have had to assess the situation. If they did respond, fine. You would use that depending on what was the need for factor eight. If, if they were about to have major surgery, the DDAVP wouldn't be enough. Um, and um, where you say wherever possible BPL concentrate, does that mean that in all probability some moderate haemophiliacs would have received commercial concentrate because of the shortfall? Yes, I mean, all, the, all these deliberations were based on an evolving understanding that you really did not want to use commercial concentrates, if at all possible, as set out so unforgettably in the World in Action documentary, which we had seen. So this was something that we didn't really ever want to do. Or, you know, if you'd said to us, what sort of factor eight you want, we would you want we would have said we want bpl factor 8 for our patients and we don't want to use anything else but the reality was they just weren't the supplies to do that so it was with reluctance great reluctance that we use commercial product and then we obviously as recommended by uk hcdo started to say well who should we prioritize to give the bpl product to and it was obviously children mildly affected patients, patients that weren't having factor eight very often because we were especially sensitive to the possibility of giving them viruses if they were only going to have a few lifetime treatments. And with mild haemophiliacs and those with von Willebrand disease, your statement suggests that the, the first treatment of choice would have been DDAVP. Yes, we would have assessed them to see whether the DDAVP Response to DDAVP is variable. You have to assess it. But we would have assessed them. I mean, von Willebrand's is a particular case because, in fact, factor eight is usually not an appropriate treatment. So all von Willebrand's we would have expected to treat with DDAVP. And mild haemophilia we would have expected to, but it would have depended on 
how much rise in factor VIII did the DDABP treatment lead to? And with, with mild haemophiliacs, if, they, if you couldn't use DDAVP, uh, um, uh, is it possible that at guys, because of the shortfall that you've explained, mild haemophiliacs might have been treated with commercial concentrates? It, it is possible. I mean, it very much depended on the clinical context. If it was a mild haemophiliac and if DDAVP wasn't going to work, which was unusual for mild, but something that happened, then you were in a difficult situation. Then it really depended on the answer to the question, why does this person need factor eight? If the answer was because they're having a hernia, it was a minor surgical procedure, you might say, I really don't, you know, this might be the only time in their life this patient gets factor eight. I might do a wait and see policy here. I might not give factor eight and see if we can get away with it with local measures. But if, on the other hand, they were having open heart surgery, they would, you know, you'd say, well, DDAVP doesn't work. This this patient will have to have factor eight. And you'd give Elstree if it was available, but right. if it was not available and you felt you had to use yes. factor eight for the reasons you've given, it could be commercial. Correct. And then you've alluded to the position of children already, but you, your statement says, um, as you've confirmed, children were prioritised to receive treatment with BPL supply, so with BPL supplies, uh, if available, effectively. So again, with children, is it possible or probable that, that uh, on some occasions at least, they may have had to be treated with uh, factor eight concentrates that were commercial concentrates because you didn't have enough Elstree product? Well, we had each month there was a supply and uh, the particular dynamic was, as I recall, the policy was Elstree sent out in terms of factor eight there was a formula related to the amount of plasma that had gone in from the local blood transfusion service. So how much factor eight came to your region was related to how much plasma Tooting had sent to Elstree. There was this formula. But we did every month, it was monthly as I recall, get, get a supply which came into pharmacy. Now children would have been our priority. And of course they need less factor eight than adults. So uh, my recollection is I don't, you know, this would have been the first choice that a child always got BPL. Uh, I can't remember giving a child commercial, but I, I couldn't be absolutely sure. Th that the formula that you've mentioned, that the amount provided by way of, of BPL factor eight concentrate was related to the amount of plasma supplied, did, did that make it difficult to to plan because you would have no control and presumably no knowledge of how much plasma had been supplied by the transfusion centre to, to Elstree? It was a very, a very long running and thoroughly unsatisfactory difficulty. And of course, there was then this great variability of financial need, you know, haemophilia doctors all around the, the region didn't know whether they were going to need to top up or not. The finance departments hated this sudden appearance of a haemophilia doctor saying, we didn't get as much BPL factor eight this month as we expected. I'm going to need to spend another 50,000 pounds topping up. They hated things like that. So it was a recurrent difficulty. And I, when we talk in a minute about the future, I remember in particular that Dr. Savage at St. Thomas's and when I was at Canterbury, because we had we, we had contracts set up with our pharmacies. We had close contact with our pharmacy divisions. I remember for some years, we directed the BPL product to the smaller centers because the doctors there didn't have, you know, they, they didn't have resource to go and order commercial. They didn't have designated budgets. They were essentially leukemia doctors. Of course, if we had that policy, St. Thomas's and the Canterbury Centre were buying in bulk, so it was much better for the NHS because we could drive down the price because we were buying such large amounts. But I remember for several, for several years, the smaller centres got the priority of BPL, which was never enough for the two regions. And then we, the two major centres in the two Southwest Thames, Southeast Thames, topped up with commercial. Now, can I 
um, just go back to the question of prophylaxis at, at guys. Um, um, what you've said in your witness statement is that uh, for adults, there wasn't at that stage a, a program of prophylactic treatment unless it was short term for target joints or surgery. Yes, adult prophylactic treatment for adults didn't really take off until later than that, although it was begun to be talked about. But there was a couple of clear indications, which was really, as you say, if somebody had had surgery, they would need factor eight for a couple of weeks to make sure that the wound didn't break down and that they would re-bleed. The other particular indication is that one of the major clinical problems in haemophilia is that if you, if you in those days, started to talk to, say, a 10-year-old boy with haemophilia and say, how are your joints, they would, they would very often say, I have one particular problem. So this, the major clinical event in haemophilia is a bleeding into a joint, the joint is damaged, and because it's damaged, it's then more likely to bleed. So you get into a cycle of bleeding causes joint damage causes bleeding. So a very common finding was that patients would have one joint in particular that was a bad one because they got into this cycle. So with, these were called target joints, and there would be occasions where they would you know, get a lot of bleeds you know, we'd see them for review, and they would say, well, I've had three bleeds into my right knee in the last month. And we would say, well, we want to calm this down by giving prophylaxis rather than waiting for the knee to bleed again. So for the next month, we'd like you to inject yourself three times a week at home, and that would calm the whole thing down. So those were the two very clear-cut indications for prophylaxis in adults at that time. Years later, it changed very significantly. And um, would those, those adults falling within either of those two categories, would, would those generally tend to be uh, severe haemophiliacs oh, yes. rather than mild or moderate? No, this is only a, these features I'm discussing were only for severe haemophiliacs. In mild and moderate haemophilia, you don't get that degree of bleeding. And then in relation to children, um, again, we're, we're still at guys here, uh, you say in your statement that children were treated with prophylaxis if deemed appropriate. Can you expand upon that, please? Yes, I've covered some of that already. So it's quite an undertaking. So you need, uh, and it, you know, you're using very expensive material. It needs to be given into a vein. It needs to be given promptly by parents who recognise a bleed. So there's a number of hoops that parents needed to jump through to be able to do home treatment. Firstly, which wasn't always the case, the child needed to have good veins. Realistically, you don't get prophylaxis going until the child's about three years old. When the, when the children were about three, we would start teaching the parents how to administer factor eight. But that was, that was the hurdle number one. Some, I would say about 10% of children, the veins were too poor. And on those circumstances, if the child was severely infected, we would insert central venous devices called portacaths, so they would have to be put in under a surgical procedure, and it would be like a little disc, like an old half crown, which you could feel underneath the skin, and then the parents were taught to inject straight through the disc, and that would take into a straight into a blood vessel. But those could get infected, so we were reluctant to do that. You'd have to be scrupulous with hygiene. But that was the first hurdle. Secondly, you know, it's a big commitment, so we, we needed to be convinced that the parents were taking this seriously. If it was from a, you know, a family with social difficulties, single parent family, if we weren't confident that the mother was going to be able to do this, then we would discuss with her whether it was actually, you know, whether she felt able to do this. They had to be trained how to spot a bleed you know, which was done by the nurses. The nurses would go and visit the home. That was a key part of it. They would go and see the facilities. Sometimes the nurse would come back and say, I really don't think this is going to work. You know, the social arrangements are so poor. So those were more criteria. They had to be able to communicate. You know, we, we absolutely needed to know if a child was having problems. If a, you know, we didn't want a mother to come in and say three weeks ago, I gave an, a treatment every day for a week because there was a bad bleed. We'd say, well, why didn't you ring us? We absolutely wanted to know if there's a problem. So these were the sort of things that we addressed. Having said that, it was pretty unusual. 
if we said, I don't think this is going to work. But it, it, it did happen in a few families. And so the children who went on to prophylactic treatment would all have been severe haemophiliacs? Severe. And was the product that was given to their families for them to use at home on a prophylactic basis always NHS product or was by, it commercial? By choice, yes, very much so. Um, to, to what extent at guys were patients given a, a, a say or a choice in the type of treatment that they had? Um, none, I would say, because in those days... I mean, I don't think the doctors were given a choice in terms of what sort of commercial concentrate. I think that, you know, there was a manager in the center. I would go and say there was a BPL shortfall, and the manager would go and order some commercial concentrate from the pharmacy, who didn't really know a great deal about factory rate concentrates, as it's not a drug, it's a blood product. But they would come to some arrangement with a commercial company for the supply to come in. So we would certainly be talking to patients about the types of concentrate and that we'd hope to get them BPL concentrate, but that they might notice on some months when the supplies, we would have a van that would send out the supplies to the parents' homes, or sometimes if the, par if the patients were coming in for review, they would pick up supplies and go home with supplies. They were certainly aware concentrates came in two different generic types. There was the British type and the American type. And the patients were understandably very keen and anxious to have the British Factor 8. You know, they used to say to you, you are going to give me British Factor 8 this month, aren't you? If they had to have commercial Factor 8, there wouldn't have been any sort of conversation about which particular product it was. I think it was perceived at that time in any case there wasn't any clinical difference in efficacy across the different commercial concentrates, and we had no evidence there was any difference in risk of infection across the commercial concentrates. So as doctors, we didn't have any sort of impetus to start making noises with the powers that be to say, we don't really like giving commercial concentrate, but we understand why. There isn't enough BPL but we really want to have a say as to what sort of commercial concentrate that sort of conversation didn't take place. You said that um, patients would express a preference for British concentrate. What was your understanding of the reasons for that preference? Well, haemophilia is a small and close-knit community. All patients are encouraged to join the Haemophilia Society. The Haemophilia Society used to produce lots of written information for them. And we used to have these residential seminars. Once or twice a year, there would be a national seminar, and we very much encouraged our patients to go. The weekends were free, and they were of great benefit to the patients. They'd be given lectures by doctors or nurses about matters of interest. There'd be little workshops they could go and attend. There'd be a dinner and a few drinks on the Saturday night. They could meet other parents. It was something that was terribly valuable. And, and this sort of very strong feeling, which we'll talk about later on in terms of the critical times coming five years later, there was this very, very strong feeling amongst the British Haemophilia Society population of, I previously described it as a sort of Tarzanoid philosophy, you know, British good, American bad. I don't want to have American Factor 8. And that a lot of that came from publications from the Haemophilia Society, or it came from these residential weekends and meeting other patients. Of course, no internet in those days. Do, do you recall whether um, during the, the, uh, the years you were at Guy's, you had conversations with patients about the pros and cons of British concentrate versus commercial concentrate? Yeah, yes. I mean, we, they, we had conversations with them, and the Haemophilia Society publications were saying that the commercial concentrates theoretically carry more risk, and we are not happy about that. And as you know, by this time, UKHCDO were beginning to have dialogues with 
Health Tree and the Transfusion Services, and there was Dr. Don, Dr. David Owen's initiative, etc. So the patients were well aware of the theoretical differences, which is where this philosophy came from, which you have to completely understand. They very much wanted to have British factor rate because it was perceived as being less likely to transmit viruses. Of course, at that time, that phrase meant hepatitis, uh, nothing known about AIDS. Um, what about concentrates versus cryoprecipitate? Again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come in more detail to, to what you say in your statement about disadvantages um, of, of, of cryoprecipitate. But as a matter of fact, do you recall whether you had conversations with your patients at Guy's explaining to them that there was this other treatment, cryoprecipitate, many of them would have presumably have known that from uh, earlier in, in the 70s. Um, did you explain to them um, your views uh, of the relative merits of cryoprecipitate versus concentrates? Well, th these are patients who, unless they were a child, would previously have been treated with cryoprecipitate, which was available in the late 1960s. So all of these patients, apart from children, knew about cryoprecipitate because it was their previous treatment before the concentrates came in. And then they didn't need any persuading at all, as you've seen from the various documentaries that have been on recently. It was such a sea change to move from cryoprecipitate, which was the first treatment, but it really was not, by any measure, a good treatment, for, which we'll talk about, to suddenly this treatment, which is what everybody, doctor, nurse, patient, had wanted, which was small volume, kept in a domestic fridge, you knew the amount of factor rate on the bottle, didn't have to be in a deep freeze, reasonable supply, easy to draw up, quick to give. From every perspective, the concentrate was so much better, and it was a much more effective treatment. You know, cryo was not a very effective treatment at stopping bleeding. You couldn't use it for prophylaxis. So the patients were fully signed up to concentrate. No patient ever said to us, can I go back on to cryoprecipitate? They would, they would have had to come off home therapy. Did, did you um, explain to patients the relative degree of viral infection risks of cryoprecipitate versus concentrate? In other words, that there was a greater risk with concentrate because of pooling? Well, I didn't know for certain that that was the case. I mean, in theory, because cryo might come from 10 donors and the concentrates come from 20,000, there were these theoretical risks. But again, I think the patients were well informed as to how concentrate was made. And I don't think they had any reservations at all. No patient ever said to me, I'm really not happy about being on concentrate because of this number of donors that the concentrates are derived from. I want to go back to having cryoprecipitate. It was known about. People maybe didn't feel very comfortable about it. The doctors didn't feel comfortable about it. It was recognized as being an Achilles heel of a treatment that was otherwise spectacularly successful. You left guys in um, late 1983. Um, did you uh, ever find out how many of the patients you cared for at guys were infected with HIV? Uh, no, there were one or two that moved down to Kent and came under my care, who obviously I did know what happened to, but the rest of them at guys. I, I didn't. I so said these weren't very large numbers. There were probably, as far as I can recollect, 10 to 15 patients on home therapy. I um, want to turn now, please, um, to, uh, in more detail, to some of the matters you've alluded to about the, the developing knowledge of, of risk um, from uh, concentrates. Can I start by asking you what you were taught as part of both first your general medical training and then your specific haematology training about the risks of viral transmission from blood and blood products well i know it's i'm asking you to think back a long time <laughs> dr winter a very long time um i don't recall in my medical training 
anything about that, but then I qualified in 1973. I now know that there was data from the late 1960s about hepatitis transmission. Um, of course, then once I'd entered hematology training, I was working both at the Middlesex and Guy's for doctors who were not haemophilia specialists. So they didn't teach me anything about that either because they didn't know anything about it. So the answer is no, I didn't get any teaching, but then I wasn't expecting it because there wasn't anybody um, when I was in training, as it were, to be teaching me about haemophilia. I, I got my information from other sources by, by reading and uh, by going to meetings. Um, and just in, in terms of reading material, written material, what, what journals or periodicals would you typically have read uh, in, in the, the late 1970s, early 1980s? I think there was a staple diet, really. Everybody read the British Journal of Haematology, so you were members of the British Society of Haematology. That was a, hema you know, wasn't much haemophilia in that, but you read it. Uh, everybody, as members of the BMA, had the British Medical Journal, there wasn't much haemophilia in that. There was the Lancet, probably the most important medical journal in Britain, and there was the New England Journal of Medicine. And those were your two main sources because they would carry important uh, articles about haemophilia. And at both of the Middlesex and Guys, we had a, a weekly journal club, I remember. So the registrars were told by the professors to make a presentation each week on an article of interest from one of those journals. And, and then what other sources um, um, uh, did, did you have of, of information? What, leaving aside for a moment UKHCDO as a potential source, which I'll, I'll, I'll come on to in a moment, what other kind of um, conversations or meetings would you attend in the late 70s or early 80s where you would uh, um, receive information about matters such as infection risks or other hazards? Well, very little, really. I mean, this, when you're training in haematology, you've already been through one postgraduate examination, which is the membership of the Royal College of Physicians. So the later doctors like of my generation went into general medicine, did another exam to get what's called the MRCP. Then to be accredited, you had to pass yet another exam the membership of the Royal College of Pathologists. So there were training programmes for that, as I reflect on your question, and I remember going over London on one afternoon a week to a series of seminars that were put on by the Hammersmith Hospital, by the Medical Research Council. So there were MRC PATH training programmes. They were main, mainly general haematology, but they were, they were four registrars in training who were building up to this really quite substantial examination, which took three days, including practicals, which you had to pass in, in order to be accredited and to become a consultant. And a, a very small fraction of those meetings, if you were lucky, might be about hemostasis and thrombosis. And do, do you recall whether any of um, those uh, meetings would have covered viral risks from the use of blood or blood products? No. I mean, as we're having this conversation, I'm getting these memories. The predecessor of Dr. Savage at St. Thomas's was Professor Ilsley Ingram, who I came to know socially. Uh, and he, I remember, going to listen to, he was one of the tutors on that course. So he, he was Professor of Haemophilia at St. Thomas's. He must have spoken to us about haemophilia. I think in his department was Professor Minucci as a trainee, and that's when DDAVP was discovered by Dr. Minucci when he was a registrar working for Professor Ingram. That would be 1970s, so I'm pretty sure that Professor Ingram would have spoken to us about the work that Dr. Minucci was doing with DDAVP. I don't remember anything, even though I'm suddenly you've taken me back to a sort of thing I haven't thought about. I don't remember anybody discussing with us, if, if you like the word non-A, non-B, that was a concept that was only circulating in haemophilia centres that was beginning to evolve sort of mid-1970s onwards. And then um, Dr Barkin um, um, was a 
an infrequent but occasional attender at UK HCDO meetings. That there are a very small number we tracked down that he, he, he went to. Did he ever come back from UK HCDO meetings and share any of the information he'd, he'd gleaned with you? No, I think he saw it as a managerial event. Um, <coughs> and again, in this period when you're either at the Middlesex or, or at Guy's, so before you take up your consultant post, um, did you ever see uh, UK HCDO minutes, either of the reference centre directors meetings, which was the, 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 the meetings attended by a yes. 10 or so, um, or the bigger meetings attended by all directors, or, or to which all directors were invited? My recollection is we wouldn't have seen the AGM minutes, which just happened once a year. But I think, as I've already said to you, we were aware of the recommendations about minimising conscience rate exposure in non-severe patients. So I think we would have seen the um, advice given by the smaller working groups of UKHCDO to be aware of that. Um, you mention having become aware of publications or information from the late 1960s about risks of hepatitis. The inquiry has seen evidence dating back certainly to the 1940s to suggest that the risk of, of hepatitis, then referred to usually as serum hepatitis, sometimes post-transfusion hepatitis, was, was known to be the major risk from blood or uh, transfusion. Um, uh, and, and have been known for decades. Uh, first of all, do you accept that as correct? Yes. D do you recall um, uh, when you would first have become aware of that? Well, I can, although we've just spoken about when I was a student, I was aware that hepatitis, there were two types of hepatitis and that they were different and that hepatitis A was not usually transmitted by blood, but hepatitis B was and um, we knew all about Australia antigen, and it was even, indeed even called serum hepatitis. So exactly as you say, by the end of the 1960s, at the very latest, that was very well established that of the two known types of hepatitis, one of them could be transmitted by blood. Um, and you were, I think, aware from what you've already said uh, that um, commercial concentrates were made using large pools of, 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 of material from paid donors. Yes. Um, I think you may have already referred to this, Dr. Winter, but um, do you recall watching that, that the 1975 World in Action programme at the time in 1975? Not at the time, but I've seen it. I know it very well because I've seen it so many times since. Um, do you recall... Um, whether, although you didn't watch it at the time, you became aware of it? Was it a topic of discussion after its broadcast in late 1975 in, in haemophilia circles? No, I have no recollection of that. I'm just going to ask to play a short extract from an interview you gave in 1988. So you're going to see your younger self on the screen in a moment, oh, no. Dr Winter. It's MDIA... Four zeros one one one, and it's the, the the first of the two clips, please, Henry. In the mid nineteen seventies, we already knew that factate could contain viruses, in particular hepatitis B or serum hepatitis. Some companies were using a very large pool size, perhaps up to twelve thousand donors per batch, so it only needed one of those donors to have a virus for all the recipients of that batch of factor eight to potentially be infected. So we knew by the mid-1970s that the American product was potentially more risky than the British product. Thank you, Henry. So I think you've, you've seen that this morning and um, the, you accept that as an, as, as an accurate account of, of your knowledge at the time? I don't think I regret any of that is my immediate reaction. Um, now... Your, your witness statement says that you knew, or clinicians knew by 1979, that commercial factor VIII was contaminated with non-A, non-B hepatitis, and that this caused cirrhosis in regularly treated patients. 
I want to take that in two stages. First of all, the existence of non-A, non-B hepatitis. Um, can, um, can you recall roughly at least when you became aware of the existence of this third type of hepatitis? So I, the easiest way to deal with this is, is to do a timeline, let's say 1973, concentrates are coming in, you're setting up a comprehensive care program with home therapy, you're working out which blood test to do, and as we've just been discussing, you're going to monitor the patient for known hepatitis viruses, for hepatitis A and hepatitis B. So that's already established in 1973, 1974. There's this revolution, the patients are all saying to you, my life is totally, utterly changed, this is wonderful. We've always called this the golden interval, little, little two-year gap, about 1974 to about 1976, where suddenly, after years of darkness, disability, pain, inability to work properly, have to go to a special boarding school, suddenly there's the land of milk and honey, home therapy, concentrates, everything is wonderful, people are feeling really good, their joints are good, started to do sports again. Everything is really, really coming along well. And then 1975, I recall, again, we were just talking about him, Professor Minucci uh, had been uh, gone on to be head of the very large centre in Milan, and he, um, amongst several other people, produced data that showed about 45%, I think, in his paper, of regularly treated patients had abnormal liver function tests of a hepatitic pattern. They didn't have hep A, and hardly any of them had hepatitis B. So this was the very start, as far as I'm concerned, of this theoretical concept of we think we're dealing with a third virus. And this term, non-A, non-B, came from the haemophilia doctors. You know, we, we, we started to realise something else is going on here. It looks like many of our patients have been exposed to it. However, they're not... The pattern of the test results is not changing very much. Obviously, every three months they came in and had the results checked. The results weren't changing very much. There were no signs of patients getting any clinical liver disorders. The patients kept saying to us, I've never felt as well as this. I never want to change. This is the treatment I've always wanted. So I think there was a feeling across the haemophilia doctors that we've noted this. It looks like there's a third virus, you have to speculate. If it is, it doesn't seem to be doing any harm. You know, viruses are variable. Maybe, you see, cytomegalovirus can affect the liver. Doesn't do a lot of symptomatology. Maybe this is something like CMV. It's just causing a little bit of mild inflammation. The massive benefits of the new therapy are there for all to see. We're just going to keep an eye on this. So this was the first phase of what's going to change in a minute. All of that changed radically around about 1978-79. Again, of various studies, you're going to be talking to Professor Preston. The Sheffield group, in particular, did a study where they bravely did liver biopsies on patients with haemophilia who had abnormal liver function tests. And what their results from that study blew out of the water instantly the idea that this was nothing to worry about. Because their study showed, as did other studies, that most of these patients had very significant chronic liver disease on biopsy. They had chronic active... There's a, there's a range of different histological stages ranging from chronic active hepatitis to cirrhosis. Most of these patients were along that pathway. So this was a dramatic finding. And this changed haemophilia doctors completely to believe this is not something that we can just relax about and just keep a look at and ignore, not ignore, but not get excited about. This is a really serious, evolving clinical problem. And we really have to look very hard 
at, you know, where is this, how, how can we minimise exposure to this third virus, non-A, non-B, as we still called it? What steps can we take to minimise further exposure to the patients who already seem to have it? And what steps can we take to minimise exposure to those patients who never received a concentrate? D Dr Winter, there's a... Um, a handful of, of publications from the 1970s I want to look at with you, but uh, so noting the time, and I'd rather do that in one go and then ask you about them, Dr Winter, than split it over the break. Should we take the break now, sir? Yes. What, uh, what we do, uh, Doctor, uh, at breaks is we take 45 minutes because it, it allows those who are here uh, to, to go and be served with their drinks and, and keep socially distant. It takes a, takes a while. So 45 minutes, uh, we'll come back at quarter to 12. 